Hello, my name is Scott Trester. I just want to start off by um, talking to you about a very deep subject about the false gospel in America today that has literally plagued our country when it comes to salvation issues. And before I start such a, a convicting message from the Holy Spirit, I just want to stop and pray for a second. So, dear God, I just thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share your word and your truth. Um, God, you have said so many verses about how the road to heaven is narrow and there are many roads that lead to death, God. And, and Lord, I just pray that this preaching would not bring conviction as much as it would bring repentance and open eyes, God, that many would be saved, Lord, because of the truth that you are about to speak through me today, Lord God. I just humble myself, Lord. I am nothing, God, but you are everything, Lord. And so I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So everywhere you go today, you you hear this religion and that religion, and um, everybody seems to have a portion of truth. And and what happens a lot of times is, is these are called religious spirits that enter into these doors of pride. And, and they say, whisper in your ear, they say, you got the truth. Now you are like better than all these other people. You now have the truth. Almost like Garden of Eden when Satan was whispering to Adam and Eve, you know, did God really say that? You know, didn't God also say this? Now you will know good and evil if you do this. You know, promising something good, and but in reality, you know, mixing truth with untruth, mixing good with evil is actually even more evil than evil itself. When you mix good and evil, and the gospel today is tainted this way. You know, the Bible says that the road to heaven is very narrow, and that few people find it. And you know, I think. Some polls probably say Americans are 80% Christians, probably 90% in some ways in a, as far as born again Christians even, it's probably like 60% I'm guessing. But yet, everywhere you go there's, there's selfishness and there's greed and there's just this lack of love and compassion and this judging for every religion that doesn't do things the way that we believe they're supposed to be done. And these religious spirits um, come in and they take over. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, now you're twice the sons of hell that you were before. Jesus said you traveled far and wide to make converts that are twice the sons of hell that you are now. And really that is what it is. It's, it's Phariseeism that is really coming to America. You know, we, we can sit sit in our you know our nice houses and we can sing songs about how great America is and not even realize the the, the literally millions of babies that are being aborted um, a lot of us don't even know who our neighbor is let alone if they're saved or a Christian or even care a lot of us are fighting with their neighbors and yet we profess to know know Jesus as our Lord and, and Savior and, and and this just shouldn't be this just shouldn't be Jesus said that the world will know you are a Christian by the way you love your brothers and your sisters and it's it's like religion has made um, millions of roads to excuse us to hate our brothers or to excuse us to not love our brothers you know we we compart mentalize everything nowadays you know you, you know he's a Pentecostal he's he's one of those or or he's a Jesus only kind of person you know he's you know, he, he's too he's far gone you know or uh, you know he's he he believes in eternal security you know he, we, we don't have to love those people let's just blast them with with some of our knowledge and excuse us for not loving them and and this kind of thing happens you know every day in Christian circles I mean religious people do this daily I mean sometimes hourly they're so busy attacking other 
uh, face. Uh, you know, they're one of them tattooed people. Oh, no, 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 they're homosexuals. You know, don't you don't have to love them. You know, or, or they're a prostitute. You know, or, or they've been through divorce. You know, they, they can't be real Christians. And and this kind of compartmentalizing of people, you know, seems to excuse us um, to not love our brothers because we think we have the truth. You know, after all, God has given me the truth, and now I'm I'm better than all of you because I, you know, God has given my little religion this little piece of 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 uh, history that my religion came from. You know, we have the only truth, and and all you other people, you know, are not of God. And these are called religious spirits that come in and and whisper these things. And and the Pharisees in Jesus' day, you know, are really the example to us of. Of the truth and and what is happening even today um, uh, you know Jesus said you're gonna even you you're gonna be drugged before these religious people and you know they're gonna kill you even and thinking they're doing God a favor and for this reason even the Antichrist could even partially come out of the religions of today and it's like I've searched studied like every religion and it's like every religion has some truth you know even even the Quran has a book of Jesus and if you follow certain letters of the law even the Quran can bring you to Jesus and it's the same with Buddhism Buddhism has a book of Verda uh, that um, actually tells about Jesus and salvation is only through Jesus you know so it's like God has given everybody a portion of faith so that they can find him and yet they've compartmentalized certain parts of, of religions and they've used that as an excuse to not love their brother. And because after all, if you don't belong to my my sect or my organization, then you know you're not of God. Is what they believe, and that's what Satan wants people to think: is that you got to belong to my organization. But uh, you know, God God just wants us to love, man. Just wants us to love the. The uh, Pharisees dragged a prostitute to him, caught in the very act of adultery. Man, let's just stone her, you know? She's she's caught in the very, she's a sinner, you know? And people even condemn Jesus, saying, hey, pff, look, he hung around with sinners, man. This this guy claims to be a prophet, and he hangs around with sinners. You know, what kind, what kind of a Messiah is he, you know? And Jesus said, hey, if any of you are without sin, throw the first stone. And and we know that the that prostitute ended up following Jesus. And he never even told her to to stop sinning. I don't think he just she just followed him in the love that he showed her. You know, changed her heart and made her a new person. I believe she was even there in the very end, following Jesus. And. Even while he was on the cross, she was ministering to him, and and so it is today. Uh, we just need to really, really know the false gospels of of knowledge and and pride and and these kind of things that that take the place of, of knowing God. I mean, if you know, religions say, hey, if you look like I do, if you look like us, if you come join a group. And look like us, you're saved. And a good example is is uh, in Jesus' day, um, a rich young ruler came to him and said, "You know, what must I do to be saved? I, I obeyed all the commandments since my earliest youth. And um, what must I do to be saved?" Uh, go uh, I'm preaching right now. Go away for a while. So. Uh, Anyway, sorry, my daughter just got home from school. Sorry about that. Um, I thought I heard her earlier, and it slowed me down a little. But um, and, and I need to go and love on her really soon, you know, because religion is nothing without love. And and uh, anyway, sorry for the distraction. But this rich ruler comes to Jesus, and he said. What must I do to be saved? And and Jesus said, all you really got to do is sell everything you own and come follow me. 
And the rich young ruler was devastated by that. You see, God always puts his finger on the one thing in your life that means more to you than him. And that's the thing God's going to say, that's got to go. You know, he's really not looking looking at all your works and saying, oh, this guy does more works. This guy obeys better. What he's looking for is love. You know, God wants love. It's like the first half of the commandments are about loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You know, maybe the a middle commandment is about loving yourself by obeying the commandments and or obeying the Sabbath and getting some rest. And then the last ones are all about loving your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Jesus said later, let's just sum it all up. You know, all you have to do is love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And you're saved. And, and, and to, when you really do that, you're not going to want to hoard all this money in my bank account and while I'm watching, you know, uh, suffering all over around me, you know, of, of people I claim to love. And so the uh, Rich and you ruler ended up going away sadly. He, he like left Jesus and, and the church today would have ran after him and said, hey, Rich and ruler, dude, you, you don't have to sell everything. You know, give us 10% or even 5%. Come to church on Sunday and you're in. Don't worry. And that's kind of the false gospel of today is, is really these religions that have worshipped pastors and men and and saints and even Mary and and different prophets, you know, the Quran and you know they're, they're worshiping other prophets and, and, and instead of God and and uh, is that really much different than worshiping my pastor, putting my pastor what he says over what God is saying? And um, so today we have to really be open to what God is doing. You know, Jesus didn't chase after that rich young ruler and say, hey, don't go away sadly. Hey, you know, give me 3% and we'll call it good. You know, but he said he was allowed him to go away sadly and to realize that he hadn't given it all. And today we just want to create what I call stillborn Christians. Um, the very day they're, that the seed is watered and sprouts, they're like, hey man, you're already in. Man, you, you don't have to worry about this thing growing into a plant that creates a hundredfold. You know, you, I, I've read you the sinner's prayer and and now you're in, you're already saved, and there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. Now, you know, that's that's what religions like you to believe. And, you know, just come to church on Sunday. And, uh, you know, we got infant baptism, and we got all kinds of traditions that are not even in the Holy Scriptures, and yet we, we count on them for our salvation. I mean, I belong to the church. I'm a leader of the church. You know, I, I'm in, man. And, 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 I, and really now I'm better than all these other people in religions because we got the right one. You know, that's what Satan wants us to believe. You know, we got the only right religion. And because of that, because of this knowledge, I don't have to love these people over here. And, and when that occurs, salvation is still a foot away. You can know all knowledge. And yet until it gets from your heart here or from your head here down to your heart, it means nothing. It says in First Corinthians that, man, I can know everything. I can have all knowledge and can have all the gifts of the Spirit, which the gifts are free. They're without repentance. And yet, in, until I have love, it's I know nothing at all. And so, you know, we, we need to know the love of God. And, and really, that's what, when you really find Christ, He introduces you to the Father and the Father's love for you and it's like you were forgiven you were forgiven all these sins so what did you do you went out and judged your brothers and your sisters and i see that so much today where every religious org seems to be you know joel holstein he's not doing it right um who cares that you know millions have heard the gospel because of him or millions have been encouraged or billions have been encouraged he's literally been in billions of households you know but he's not doing it the way I 
say you should do it. So therefore, let's just slander him in front of the whole world. And that's going to that's gonna prove that I am just as good. You know, it's this kind of thinking. It's this kind of evil that has ruined the Church of America today. And I used to think that, you know, Americans were the ones that are going to be saved. They're, they're, you know, they're this great patriotic country. And, and I remember for a lot of years, I, I sought God just for the fish and the loaves. You know, I, I saw my brother... My brother-in-law had this house on the lake and this nice boat and all this stuff. And I thought, God, why don't you love me as much as you love him? You know, and although I never believed in the prosperity gospel, my life kind of showed that I did. And I started, you know, really seeking those things. And I don't know if it was Satan, you know, it could have been Satan that blessed me with the world. For a long time, I got the world's goods. and. You know, Jesus, Satan told Jesus, hey, if you bowed, or Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give them to you. Satan said, they're mine to give you the world. And Jesus, you know, of course said, no, and yet some of us are, are actually saying yes to this, the God of prosperity. And anyway, I became quite wealthy, and yet I was miserable as a Pharisee. And... I remember crying out to God, saying, there's got to be more than this. You know, my things are controlling me. You know, I'm sure the, the religions that I were part of loved me. I donated all kinds of things to them, live venison, deers that I raised, and, and all the different things. And, and they, the world loved me. Even the church loved me when I was in this false uh, place of, of living for the world. And... and Finally, one God day, just I poor gave everything again to God, just begging Him because my life was so empty of love and it was so empty. And God spoke to me, said, Scott, you're going to lose everything. And I said, Okay, Lord, here it is. And I opened my hands, arms, I started giving. And I ended up going to, I think I was worth close to a million or more. I've had figured once before that. And I started giving money after that, giving money, and, and my jobs actually started losing money. I was in many, had some bit, several business things going on, and um, I started losing on every project. But yet, I was giving away even more than I made. And I thought, well, you know, the religion said, yeah, you just gotta give. So I was like giving ninety percent of my profits to God. Like, oh man, now I'm really, I'm, I got the right, the right system down. God is gonna bless me. And, and that never happened. I ended up losing everything just like God had promised me. And But yet, through that, I actually found God, and now I'm really rich. Um, I'll give you an example of what had happened. One thing that had happened is I, I started building homes in Mexico for the poor. And the first time I went down there, I thought, man, I'm just going to help these poor people. And I got down there, and I started helping these poor people, and I realized... They're the rich ones. The Bible says God has chosen the poor people of this world to be rich in His Spirit. And uh, these, these dads that we're building, helping them, they're, they're walking 10 miles home to have breakfast with their children. You know, I'm meeting people and they're like, my home is your home. You know, they, they, they've been saving this can of pop for two months. And, but when you come, they're like, here, man, I want you to have it. You know, the love, the hospitality. I actually felt loved. And and I found that we Americans were the poor ones. And and on one of those trips, I met uh, my friend Juan. Uh, he had become one of my sons. Man, I love him like my son. And, and he had he had actually asked for um, um, some time with me. And, I, and I, I, I spent a lot of time with him and got to know him, uh, building homes down there and different things. And... And uh, after a while, he, he texted me one time and said he had sold, wanted to sell half of his clothes. He was selling half of his clothes to help a homeless person that lived at the dump. And he himself had been through a very hard life. I don't know if I want to say it all on here, but, you know, he had a terrible life. And yet, here he is in his tw early 20s, maybe, and he's selling half of his clothes to help a homeless person get some medical attention. And I was so broken that of all my 1,500 friends I had at that time on Facebook, I said, 
put a post on there. I'm like, hey, can, I got a friend in desperate need. If anybody can help them, I've never asked for money before, but this time, man, if you can spare anything for this friend, this anonymous friend, because I didn't want them to know, because Juan was also my friend on Facebook. I didn't want him to know it was for that I was begging for him or everybody else to know, because I wanted to honor him and. Of all my 1,500 friends, only one person texted me and said, Scott, I want to help. And do you know who that person was? That person was Juan, my son from Mexico. And he said, oh, man, I, I just sold my clothes. I don't have much. I got maybe 25 cents or 50 cents I want to give you. But, but I want to help you. Uh, whatever your problem is, I want to just do whatever I can. And, and what I realized, he was the only one, that he, the only person offering to help me was the very person in Mexico I was trying to help. It, it broke something in me, it broke me. And um, I ended up spending like a whole month with him, with Juan in different times and, and ended up going to the dumb people and going to the different people and, and helping the poor and finding out just how rich they were and how really empty Americans are. And it changed my life and I remember another time in San Diego or yeah, San Diego California uh, there's this homeless guy and he's maybe 65 80 maybe and he has got a, all his junk around him and he stinks man I could literally smell him 200 feet away because everything he owned was right there and he couldn't even get to the bathroom so his feces would be close by and he and I thought man this poor despicable person you know and I decided to go witness to him and I brought him a cheeseburger and he didn't seem real interested in the food or he he actually started sharing God with me and it turned out he trusted God and he, he really didn't care if I brought him a cheeseburger because he knew somebody was gonna feed him he he trusted God and he started sharing with me these revelations that he had and and how great things God had done for him and I thought, here I am, an American, and I'm miserable. I got all this stuff, and I'm miserable. And here is this, you know, homeless guy, and he's got nothing, and yet he's happy. And he, and then he turned to me and he said something to me I'll never forget. He said, Scott, why do you think God has chosen me to to show all these visions and all these wonderful things? You know, well, he's like, Scott, why am I so special that? God has showed me this homeless person this stuff. And I thought, here, here this guy is happy. He's got nothing, he, but he's happy. He's filled with joy. And he trusts God like the sparrows. He, he's in, his health is gone. He really needed some medical help. And later that night, I went back to talk to him some more. And, and I saw an ambulance leaving, and I'm pretty sure he was on that ambulance. and and I'm pretty sure he didn't make it. Um, but it changed my life. And I came back having a totally different view of Americans, even wondering if an American can be saved after seeing the real world and, and how materialistic we are and how really controlled we are by money and, and pride. And, you know, Jesus said, unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow me. What, did, what does that mean, take up a cross and follow him? Well, Jesus, Jesus laid down his life for our friends, and that's what Jesus said. And now you need to lay down your life for others, for your friends. And, and uh, that's just not happening, you know, and that's really the gospel is, you know, when you trust Jesus, instead of trusting your 401k, instead of trusting your religious organization, instead of trusting your pastor, you know, instead of trusting your infant baptism, you know, instead of trusting all these fake things, you know, are you really trusting that Jesus saved you? And if you are, this life-changing experience that, hey, God forgave you, so now why don't you go and forgive. That's really the evidence of if you're saved. I said, are, are you going now and forgiving all those who have sinned against you? And God even went on so far to say, is to him who says, I love God and hates his neighbor or hates his brother, 
he's a liar. And I, I know, I know to hate your brother doesn't just mean, you know, you're trying to kill him. But if you have hate in your heart, if, if you haven't forgiven in your heart, if you're still holding grudges and, and you still have anger and you're still pushing them out of your life, that's hate. And, you know, there are times where God calls you to not be yoked with unbelievers. And, but yet, loving is, is another thing. I mean, Jesus said to love your enemies. And if we can't even love those who we see, how can you love God in whom you've, you've never actually seen with your eyes? And so I just want to speak out to the churches of America and, and just ask you, you know, is your religion really, really fulfilling the Ten Commandments in a nutshell to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself? Is that really what your religion is doing? I know with all your Super Bowl parties and all the things you're doing, you're, you're making a lot of movements, you're doing a lot of stuff, you're busy, but yet, you know, are you really discipling people? Are you really changing them? Um, are you giving stuff for free? Um, are you looking for tithes and offerings, or are you, 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 you giving, man? Are you giving? You know, God is not going to say, wow, what kind of building did you build? You know, did you build a nice facility? You know, he's going to say, what about the homeless? You know, what about the aborted? What about, what about those people that came to your house that, were, that wanted to know Jesus? You know, what about your neighbors? And this is really where the rubber meets the road, folks. And, the road to heaven is very narrow. The Bible says, if you find it, I know a lot of you radical religious people, you, man, Jesus is coming back, and, and man, we're all going to heaven pretty soon. And, but the Bible says that, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And it also says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when Jesus comes back. And, and I look at that and I say, in Noah's day, there was only eight people saved. In in, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, it was only Lot and his two daughters. And, and if, if that's all that was saved back then, and you think it's, it's the same as it was today, then friends, there ain't very many people saved. The Bible might be right. The road to heaven might be even narrower than you think. I mean, the religious Pharisees thought they were saved. They, they were going around killing Christians thinking they were doing God a favor. They were these great religious people after all. And, and the Bible talks about humility and, and really I'm nothing. If you think I'm trying to say, hey, I'm better than any of you, that's just simply not true. I, I, I am only good because of what Christ has done for me, what God has done. In, in me dwelleth no good thing. And if I really believe that, how can I think I'm better than anybody else? You know? And, you know, a lot of us are so busy trying to clean the outside of the cup, man. We just gotta look. We just gotta have this look like, like we're real Christians. And then God's gotta accept us, you know? And that never happens, folks. You know, you need to come to Jesus as you are and lay down your life and really let him clean the inside of the cup and that that comes through loving and Jesus love cost him something Jesus love for you cost him everything in this planet he gave his life he even that allowed the father to turn on him and yet he faced the cross and endured death to show you a better way than living for yourself and and uh I guess I'm just gonna end this. I gotta, I gotta get back to my daughter here, but I want you to know God loves you. And, and the Bible says, when they search for me with all their heart, then they will find me, says the Lord. And a lot of you have been looking, you've been looking, you, you've been watching your brother-in-law and your sisters and, and your friends. You've seen the success they seem to have and you want that. And, and, but look at, the, look at the parable of the farmer who planted the seed. And, 
instead of telling the seed, hey, you're, you're, you're growing up, all right, don't worry. You're part of the church now. Instead of saying that, realize that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. As long as you're breathing, there's a chance for you to fall and there's a chance for you to be saved. And you gotta hang through to the end. The seed is growing, the world is trying to choke it out. It's got these false doctrines and it's got pride and it's got temptations and all these things. And and if we keep believing, hey, we're, we're saved just because the seed has started to grow. That's not the real gospel, folks. You know, Jesus said, unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to even be my disciple. You know, if, if you're not, if you haven't done that and laid down your life, then even though you're seeking God, it's for selfish reasons. Man, maybe the Bible says, out of fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. You know, man, fear of hell is the reason I first started claiming to be a Christian. It might even have been what started my seed growing, is just fear of hell and the reality of knowing it's real. But yet, I was still, I was still uh, a Pharisee. I was fear-based salvation. And although fear of the Lord might be the beginning of wisdom, it's not the end. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And once you know God, once you allow, give your life to Jesus and surrender your life to Jesus, He introduces you to the Father and the Father's love. And that perfect love will cast out all fear. It will help you to be who God wants you to be. Uh, you know, you need to stop trusting in your own works and start trusting in God and God alone and what Christ has done for you on the cross and allow yourself to love like Him when you die to yourself. <coughs> but anyway, I just need to end this with prayer right now and say God loves you and He's got a great plan for your life. And it's not a religion. It's, you can go direct. You can go direct right to God. And He's waiting. He wants everything. You, you don't have to clean yourself up first. He wants you as you are. If you, if you have to clean yourself up first, then you are taking the substitute. You are the substitute for what Christ has done for you. You're trying to be good enough. And what's going to happen after that is you're going to say, Hey, I did this to get here. Now you didn't do this. You're not really a, arrived like I have. And so, as you are, realize the, the selfishness and the sin. And I know a lot of you, some of you are on one camp say, oh, I never sinned. Uh, I got saved 20 years ago and I haven't sinned. And all sinners are going to hell. Well, Paul called himself the chief of sinners. When, when Paul was obeyed all the law, flawless, when Saul was still Saul and he had obeyed all the commandments, flawless, it says, uh, he had been, he was the Jews of Jews, he was of the highest rank of Jews when he was Saul. He obeyed all the commandments from his earliest youth. It was blasphemy, worthy of death, to claim to be God. So when he was chasing Christians and trying to kill them, he was actually obeying the law. And he called himself blameless. And yet, when he found Jesus and became a real Christian, he then said, called himself the chief of sinners. And sometimes I think it takes a saint to know that they are a sinner. Every single human being thinks they can justify what they've done. The Bible says that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but that each man does what's right in his own eyes. What that means is you can go to prison, you can talk to the murderer, he says, hey man, they deserve to die. They didn't deserve the gift of life, that's why I killed them. You talk to the rapist and they're, hey, she dressed seductively, she, she acted like she wanted it. You know, the, the thief says, man, the banks, they've been stealing from us, I'm like Robin Hood, you know? And everybody can justify the sin they've done. But yet, I believe it takes a saint to know they're a sinner. I know I'm a sinner because when I was coming home from work the other night and I had a headache and I wanted to get home, instead of witnessing to the guy at the counter, man, I selfishly 
had to get home to be with my own family or to get some aspirin, you know. And and we're sinners, man. We're sinners, not by choice even, but because the Bible says that only God is truly good. And the difference between a Pharisee and a really saved person is there's good in everybody, and that good is God. But the Pharisee will take the credit for the good in them, which is actually God. And the, the man of God gives God all the credit for the good in him. He, he's just letting God flow through him even more. I don't know if a lot of you understand, but in the days of the flood, before the flood, God's spirit wasn't in everybody like they are today. The Bible says God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh so that this wouldn't happen again, as it get as bad as it was in the days of the flood. God, right now, God has poured His Spirit out on all flesh. There's good in everybody, and that good is God. But the difference is, some of you are taking the credit for it yourself, and you're using that to to judge your neighbor and to condemn your neighbor. And but a real man or woman of God realizes that the good in them is God, and gives Him the glory, and dies to himself, and allows him to actually be part of the creation that God made them to be. And so that's my prayer for you and for me. And I, with that, I'm going to end in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this time together, Lord. Just move on their heart. Holy Spirit, And we ask you to just confirm these things, Lord God. Confirm these things. Help us to turn from our selfish ways and our religious ways, these, these demons of pride and and selfishness and arrogance, God. We just turn from them now. And Lord, help us to really love our neighbors, to really love the sinners, God, and to, to love everybody, Lord, and, and to stop knocking down others that don't do it our way, God. Uh, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your time. Jesus loves you. God bless you.